Hello and welcome to another CPD talk. My name's Jasmine, I'm one of the senior BMSs in blood transfusion and today I'm going to be talking to you about phenotyping. We're going to cover what it is, why we use phenotyping and how it can help with antibody ID, the limitations of this technique, how we overcome these and then we're going to reaffirm the learning with case study one and case study two. This should be quite a short presentation, um, but it's a nice introduction to this technique that people may not be as familiar with when you're first starting out. So let's get started. Phenotyping is the process of confirming what antigens are on a patient's red blood cell. So we would use reagent antibodies to react with the patient's red blood cells. It can be done using cards with reagents already present or by adding anti-sera in either a card or tube technique. So it works very similar to the forward group and if you think of that grouping analogy the antibody screen is the reverse group because that's where you're looking at what patient antibodies are present with reagent red cells and antigens and the forward group is like the phenotyping because we've got the reagent antibodies um, and patient antigens. Therefore, if a patient has a positive phenotype, this means that they, for the most part, cannot have the corresponding allo antibody. And conversely, if the patient has a negative phenotype, then this indicates that they could have the allo antibody. So in the same way, if we go back to that grouping analogy, that if the patient's forward group will be positive with the A reagent. So they're going to be a group A because their red cell antigens will be A and then they're going to have the antibodies for B but be negative for those A antibodies. So they're not going to have the antibodies to the antigen that's on their red cells. So it's a very similar process where if we do a panel and say it looks like a anti-JKA, if that patient then has is positive for JKA antigen, then that means it's not going to be an allo JKA antibody. However, if there's negative, then it could be an allo JKA antibody. Obviously, depending on your results, would depend on how definite that is. So, why do we use phenotyping? The first reason is pretty much what I've just explained, is it's a very useful technique where it helps us assign an antibody specificity. Basically saying that if this patient is negative in their phenotype and the antibody screening techniques that we've done show that it is this antibody, then it is just more certain that it's that antibody. Secondly, it can help in emergency situations. So obviously I'm talking about all sorts of phenotyping. When you're in the lab, you tend to talk about the two different types. You've got extended phenotyping and then you've got your RH phenotyping. Depending on what lab you work in will depend on your protocol surrounding this and also on what, you, what reagents you have available to you. But the majority of labs will be able to do the RH phenotype. So in an emergency situation, and there could be several of these where it's applicable, being able to RH match blood helps a lot. So for example, if you have a patient who's bleeding, you have processed the group and screen, but you haven't gone any further, it shows they have a positive antibody screen. It takes a lot less time to do the RH phenotype than it does to do the antibody panel. So if they need blood, now, then having an RH matched unit of blood means that you've negated the chances if that antibody is an RH antibody of them having that transfusion reaction. So it just has like an extra layer of safety. So not only is it going to be the patient's own blood group, it's also if they do have an RH antibody, we're negating that. Other situations which follow a very similar reasoning are if a patient is on treatments such as daratumumab where you end up with the pan reactive antibody screens having rh match blood again negates the chances of an rh antibody or if you've got a sickle cell patient again 
that you're waiting to finish testing most of them we will have pre-tested for their RH um, phenotype so it can help us to get the most suitable blood possible in the situation um, it can also help to indicate whether a patient has an aloe or an autoantibody. So I just want to expand on that. Obviously, when you're in the lab, you can't... When you're in the lab in a routine hospital, you cannot definitively say, yes, this is definitely an autoantibody. However, if you do your testing and do the phenotype, and let's say your testing has revealed that it looks like an anti-biggie, but your phenotype is positive for Big E, then that indicates you don't have to select Big E negative blood for most circumstances. So although you can't be 100% sure it is an autoantibody, you know it's probably not going to be an alloantibody. So that's what I mean by that statement. And finally, it's useful to stop patients from forming extra antibodies. So as I said, obviously normally if you're assigning the antibody specificity and it's not one BRH, you would do an extended phenotype. In most labs, as well as that, you would do the RH phenotype as well. And that's because when a patient develops one antibody, they're a lot more likely to develop further antibodies. So by selecting RH matched blood, it prevents them from forming antibodies to the RH antigens. how can it be used to help with antibody IV? I've sort of covered this in the previous slides, but again, it will depend on what your in-house options are for phenotyping, but it can be really useful in confirming an antibody's presence, especially if you have an antibody that's expressing dosage, like anti-M. Sometimes it can almost look like anti-M, but you're not sure. Being able to do that phenotype will either disprove the presence of an anti-M or allow you to think okay until I'm sure I will select antigen negative blood for this patient um, and again if you've got a patient that has an FYA for example and you can't exclude an anti-biggie if you've got that phenotype that says that they are biggie positive then you wouldn't need to select antigen negative blood for biggie and the last statement is sort of what we covered in the last slide about the allo or autoantibodies. With all technique, there are limitations. <laughs> so similarly, if we go back to that analogy of the grouping results, when you have a patient that you've transfused blood that is not their own blood group, you end up with the mixed field results in the forward group because you're detecting the patient cells and the donor cells. It is the same in phenotyping. If someone has been recently transfused, then you're going to detect the donor cell phenotype. And the chances of you matching up a patient's phenotype exactly are negligible. Um, therefore, if a patient has been transfused in the last three months and you want to do a phenotype, the chances are it's not going to be an accurate representation of the patient's phenotype. As well as this, if a patient has a strongly positive DAT, then you could get weakly positive results that are false positives. And with drugs like daratumumab, you can again get false positives. This is why when a patient is starting a drug like daratumumab, it's important to send it away for phenotyping before they start the drug. Um, however, if needed, we can still perform some testing. Uh, the most common alternative to phenotyping is genotyping. Genotyping is the testing of the patient's genomic DNA to predict the red cell antigen phenotype for selected antigens. So it can be used as an alternative. I will say phenotypes and genotypes do not always match up because we are using phenotypes to predict genotypes quite often. So when you hear people throwing around those terms like r1 r1 or r0 little r etc that's when we're using the phenotype to predict the patient's genotype we are always looking at the most likely outcome so actually genotyping is more accurate than phenotyping however it will depend on the patient 
Gene hammy is also used in very specific situations where a patient may have a positive phenotype but still have an allo antibody to the antigen. So this can be due to a partial antigen site. So variants. That's basically how we would overcome the limitations of phenotyping. We would ask for a genotype, but it will depend on the situation. If it is just that the patient has been recently transfused, we're trying to confirm one antibody, then we'll probably wait until their trans the three month period has lapsed because obviously genotyping is a lot more expensive than phenotyping. So it shouldn't be used as routinely. Let's get into some case studies to have a look at what we've gone through so far. The first case study is about a male patient who has come into the hospital and needs to be taken for surgery. He's never been seen before at the hospital and needs emergency blood as his sample has not finished testing. Whilst they're transfusing the first unit, the group and screen finishes and reveals a positive antibody screen. The ward is phoned, but what would you do next? So obviously we want to make it a priority to test the patient's antibodies, so do a panel. But if we have the phenotype, then at the very least any further blood that this patient needs, can, the RH phenotype, can be RH matched, which would negate the possibility of it being an RH antibody affecting the patient. This isn't always going to work because it depends on what the antibody actually is. So. What actually happened was the BMS put the samples on for a panel and retrieved the units from the ward. One unit was incompatible and the other was not. The sample was unfortunately insufficient to complete the panel. Um, there was a second sample but it is also small. During its processing the BMS had set up further cross matches to try to have some suitable blood ready for if the patient did continue to bleed. So throughout this, the BMS had not put on an RH phenotype to aid them with the cross-matching. If they had, then when they were selecting these initial units to cross-match, it could have narrowed down their search. A more experienced BMS came to help out and performed an RH phenotype and a panel manually on the second sample. Once the phenotype had finished running, it showed that out of the extra 10 units cross-matched, only four of them match the patient's RH. So if the antibody was an RH antibody, then they would not be compatible. So you can see where if the BMS, who was initially dealing with the situation, had done the RH phenotype first, it could have cut down his work in terms of the actual cross-matching that he was doing. Um, and it meant would have meant that he could cross-match more units that would be more likely to be compatible with the patient. However, didn't really make that much difference in this case because the patient actually had an anti-FYA. they had been previously transfused at another hospital five years ago and they did not need any further uncross-matched blood so we were able to give them compatible blood. So obviously in this circumstance the RH phenotype didn't really make that much difference but if it had been an RH antibody then it could have made a big difference. So it's about understanding that yes, performing the RH phenotype may not make that difference in six out of 10 of the cases that you deal with. But if it makes that difference in four out of 10, then it's still a very useful tool and it should still be performed as an urgent test when you're trying to deal with emergency situations. So we're moving on to case study number two. A routine antenatal screen shows that a patient has antibodies. When panel 1 is run, it looks as though the patient has an anti-little k. But anti-big C, big E, M, N, S, FIA and JKB cannot be excluded. If we have a look at this panel, you can see that anti-little k, it matches the pattern beautifully, but it only actually gives us one cell to exclude on. That makes it very difficult to actually determine the antibody specificity. 
in these sorts of cases i would have a look at the second panel and see whether or not that could aid us because we've still got a lot of clinically significant antibodies there that while the pattern doesn't match up if there's more than one antibody present it could be appearing to look like that anti little k panel two was run and it narrowed the antibodies down to big c big e and n that could not be excluded so looking at this now, obviously we've managed to exclude the majority of the clinically significant antibodies. How would you further deal with this patient? Bearing in mind what we've just spoken about, you've got a couple of things to think about. Anti-N is not normally clinically significant, so we'd normally just set up extra units to cross-match. Big C and Big E are clinically significant, but as previously stated, most hospitals have an RH phenotype available, which can be used to give an indication as to whether those antibodies are present. If the patient's phenotype was positive, Big C and Big E, then it would mean that we wouldn't need to select Big C, Big E negative units for cross-match. And as N isn't clinically significant, you would just select an extra couple of units to set up. Obviously, in this case, it's an antenatal patient, so we wouldn't be cross-matching on this sample anyway, and should have the time to send away samples for to the NHSBT for intervention. But if it had been a patient that was in the hospital and needed blood urgently, using all of the different techniques at your disposal using both of your panels, using your phenotyping that you have in-house can really help to narrow down what antibodies are actually present when you've got a situation like this and allow you to give blood without having to wait for a report from the NHSBT. Not only that, but if you are able to exclude the big C, big E and, the, and you've only got the N and the little K left, then technically you're not going to need an urgent report at all from the NHSBT and that makes it easier for them as well. They don't have to prioritise our work over other hospitals' work. So by educating ourselves, we're helping patients in other hospitals as well, which is why it's really important to know about all of the tools in the lab that you can use. Hopefully this talk has helped anyone who wasn't sure of phenotyping understand how it can be such a useful tool in transfusion. I'd like to thank you all so much for listening. I hope it was interesting and I look forward to seeing you all next time. Bye!